Namaste, we move forward with our revision module. So, in module 9 we looked at logging and yield, logging and processing, growing stock and increment and yield and sustained yield. Now, logging uh, the process of logging or cutting trees and harvesting trees begins with the stage of cruising in which the timber lands are surveyed to locate and estimate the volume and grade of standing timber that meets the requirements. This is followed by marking which is a selection of trees for harvesting based on a forest management prescription. Standard colors are used and typically yellow or orange means that a tree has to be cut uh, for harvest, blue means that it has to be retained. Typically, uh, we use blue for, uh, for trees that are very close to a river, red is boundary line, white is research plot and black is a correction marking to mark over the mistakes. So, uh, during marking we make an enumeration register followed by a marking register. The enumeration register tells us what each tree is, how does it look like, what are its characteristics and then the marking register uh, makes use of the enumeration register to uh, specify which trees are to be felled and how do these trees look like, what is their species, what is their diameter, what is the height, what is the condition and so on. Then felling is done in uh, using axe, saw, chainsaw or other devices. The most important factor is safety on the floor and especially the distances that need to be maintained from different equipment and also from the falling tree. So, we decide on the escape paths which are typically 45 degrees to the back of the filling. We decide on two escape paths for every tree. Now, in the process of logging we make the cuts. So, there are different cuts, you have the face cut on the front which comprises of the top cut and the bottom cut and followed by a back cut and the portion that remains in between is known as the holding wood which also acts as a hinge. So, this is how the cuts are made, you make the top cut then bottom cut followed by the back cut. Now, conventionally three phases are generally used, the first one is a conventional phase where the top cut is at 45 degrees, the bottom cut is parallel to the ground. The uh, Humboldt cut has a top cut which is parallel to the ground and a bottom cut which is downwards and there is also an open cut where the angle is greater than 70 degrees. And all these three phases have different advantages, the conventional phase has the greatest accuracy in constructing the phase cuts, Humboldt phase has the greatest saving of timber and open phase provides the, the greatest control by the hinge wood. So, this is how a front cut is being made, back cut made with a saw and uh, the portion that remains uh, makes up for a hinge. So, this is how a stump looks like, then you have the felled logs, then these felled logs are delimbed. So, delimbing is the process of cutting off the branches, generally these branches are left on the side so as to protect the regeneration and also to act as uh, food for the herbivores. But in our country because of a uh, dearth of timber, we, uh, generally these branches are also taken out. Then bucking is the process of cutting the timber to size, then hammer marks are put on this on these timber blocks and then these timber is skidded from the logging area to the landing area, typically using elephants or tractors or labor and then th uh, on the landing side uh, these timber are arranged in the form of stacks. So, this is how stacks look like and uh, uh, these stacks are also known as thuppies and in the uh, we also maintain register for a thuppy and then there is loading and transportation in which the logs are moved from the landing area to a depot. This loading can be done using a crane or through uh, using a forwarder. A forwarder is a machine in which you have a truck and a crane together. Then it is unloaded in a depot and in the depot uh, the typical processes are seasoning in uh, which is a process in which the amount of moisture in the uh, wood is reduced slowly so as to avoid any deformities. Then grading is done in which timber of similar size and shape and condition is put together and then the graded lots are made, they are again marked with paint and then they are put up for auction. 
Now, people can use the, uh, this wood directly to make furnitures or other stuffs or they can convert it into plywood and generally soft wood is used to make plywood. In the process of making plywood, first of all the, uh, the timber is converted into uh, thin sheets like shavings and then these sheets are uh, glued together using a press. In the next lecture, we looked at growing stock and in increment. Growing stock is defined as volume of all living trees more than x centimeter in diameter at breast height or above buttress if these are higher, measured over bark from the ground or stump height to a top stem diameter of y centimeter excluding or including branches to a minimum diameter of z centimeters and it excludes small branches, twigs, foliage, flowers, seeds, stump and roots. So, essentially growing stock is the volume of all the timber of all the trees put together and because uh, uh, very small uh, timber is difficult to measure. So, we typically uh, remove uh, very small timber from these calculations and in India x is taken to be 10 centimeters. So, it is the sum total of all trees by number or volume or biomass growing within a particular area of interest. Now, we also define a commercial growing stock, which is the part of the growing stock of species considered as actually or potentially commercial under current market conditions measured above a minimum say x centimeter diameter at breast height. Now, there are different factors that affect growth in natural forest, regeneration, spatial distribution, silvicultural treatment, artificial thinning, site conditions, climatic conditions. And similarly, in the case of plantation forest, these are the factors that influence growth, initial spacing and treatment, silvicultural treatment, uh, artificial thinning and pruning, site conditions including nutrition and climatic conditions. Next, we look at the logistic growth equation, which is the equation for the S shaped sigmoidal curve and uh, this tells us that the, that the change in the growing stock, which is d y by d t is equal to r, which is the intrinsic growth rate multiplied by the growing stock at that particular point of time multiplied by k minus y divided by k, where k is the carrying capacity of the environment. Now, if we look at this curve, there are three phases. This is the lag phase, where the growth is very slow. This is high and then you have the phase of stagnation or, or stability. So, we have the lag phase, log phase and the stationary phase. Now, increment is defined as an increase in diameter, growth, basal area, height, volume, quality or value of individual trees or crops during a given period. So, increment is what is changing, what is the increase. And in a stand, trees put increment, but not all at the same time. And so, we define different components of increment. So, in growth or recruitment is the volume of those trees that were not counted in the first measurement due to their small diameter, but are now countable due to the increase in diameter. Harvest is the volume of those trees that were harvested during the measurement period. Mortality is the volume of those trees that died during the measurement period. And then we can define the, uh, the net growth in growing stock as v 2 minus v 1 that is the change in the growing stock in the two uh, measurement periods. So, v 2 minus v 1, then net growth in initial volume is v 2 minus v 1 plus h which is the trees that were harvested minus i which is the, uh, the trees that were recruited in this period and uh, gross growth in the initial volume is given as v 2 minus v 1 plus h minus i plus m. Then we define periodic annual increment as the increment over a period of p years at any stage in a tree's history. So, it is uh, p a i is the, the growing stock at time t minus growing stock at a time t minus p divided by p. So, this is the average rate of increment over a specific period. If this specific period is made to be one year, then we call it a current annual increment which is the increment over a period of one year at any stage in the trees history. So, if we look at the logistic growth equation, the C A i will be given as the differential of this curve or y prime t. So, here you have the logistic growth equation, this one is y prime. Now, y prime is essentially the slope of this curve 
So, in this portion it will be very less, in this portion it will be, be, be very less, in this portion it will be, be maximum, which is what we are seeing here. We also define mean annual increment, which is uh, the, the increment over the whole period from origin to a specific age. So, mean annual increment is given by the growing stock at time t divided by t, which is what we are seeing here by this yellow curve. Now, the C A i is maximum at the point of inflection and the M A i is maximum at, at the point where C A i and M A i are cutting each other. And the, this point of cutting also gives us the optimum harvest time. This is the time when the stand has reached its maximum mean annual in increment. After this point, the stand will continue to add it to its growing stock, but at a lower rate. Now, what are the factors affecting increment? These are species, internal conditions, both genetic and physiological, and external conditions, climatic, edaphic, and biotic. Site quality is defined as the relative productive capacity of a particular site. The, the relative productive capacity, not the absolute productive capacity, because the Act, uh, the absolute productive capacity is given by a combination of site quality plus the management inputs. So, site quality asks the question, if you are not doing any management input to the site, what is the amount of growing stock or increment that this site can support. Now, what are the management inputs? They are fertilizer, site treatment, irrigation, grazing, control over soil compaction and growing stock manipulation. Now, the measurement of site quality is done in through various methods. The first one is the CVP index or the Patterson index. This is the formula T v into P into G into E divided by T a into 12 into 1000 and uh, forest growth happens only when i is greater than 25. The other option is that of looking at the vegetative characteristics. So, you actually look at what plants are growing in that area. So, you can look at the species such as if you see that palash is there in, in an area, then palash is an indicator of a degraded forest or it tells you that the site quality is not that high. And uh, you can also look at tree characteristics that is you can look at what is the size of the trees that are actually growing there. If they have a large dbh, if they have good basal area, if they have good height, good volume, then it will tell us that the site quality is good. Now, field estimation of site quality is done through two methods crop height method and the sample plot method. Now, in the crop height method, you get the top height and compare it with the yield table, which will give you the, uh, the top heights for different site qualities. Now, top height is not the height of the tallest trees, it is the mean height of trees with the largest dbh in a stand. This, uh, the second method is the sample plot method, in which case we plot the diameter height curves and then compare them with the standards. So, here we are seeing that there are these four different standards 1, 2, 3, 4 and this is the, uh, the actual field situation. So, we can say that this one is very close to site quality 3. Next, we looked at yield and sustained yield. Yield has got two meanings, the amount of timber that can be harvested per period, which is typically taken to be one year. So, the amount of timber that you can harvest every year or the second meaning is the amount of timber that can be removed at any time, which is asking the question that if you look at a snapshot of the forest, what is the total inventory of growing stock that is available that can be removed. But typically, we go with sustained yield, which is yield that can be harvested every year till perpetuity. Now, to find out these yields or to compute these yields, we have different methods. The, uh, the easiest one is the area method. Now, in the area method, we say that for an even aged crop, the, the area that should be processed every year is equal to the total area divided by the rotation period. So, this is a very simple method, it works for even aged crop, each coop can be intensively treated. However, it is difficult to predict volume, so you cannot tell what is the amount of timber that you will be extracting every year, what is the uh, value that you will be generating every year, it is difficult to tell and it is not suited for uneven aged crops. The second method is the volume method. It is a slight modification of the area method. So, the volume that can be extracted every year or the volume that can be harvested is equal to the total volume divided by the rotation period. 
the disadvantages are that it does not include growth and increment of the crop and it does not consider the site quality. And the next method is the Handishagan's method of yield regulation, which essentially says that if you have more inventory, if you have more crop, then you can extract more, if you have less crop, you can extract less. So, essentially harvest is proportional to the inventory or h by i is a constant. However, even in this case, there is an issue, because in the case of very young crops, this will uh, uh, continue to give us some value of harvest, even though there is no tree that is mature enough for harvesting. Now, one very commonly used method is the von Mintel's method, which approximates inventory by the area of a triangle, and it tells us that the volume that can be extracted every year is equal to 2 times of the inventory divided by r or 2 times the growing stock divided by r. So, as against the volume method, which told us that the amount extracted is growing stock divided by r, this one says that you can extract 2 times of that, because the growing stock is not a stationary thing, it is also putting up increment. So, this is an improvement over the volume method. Then we also have the Austrian formula, which says that you can extract the annual increment, but then you also have to consider the excess inventory over the normal forest that needs to be adjusted and this adjustment can be done over a, a period of say p years, in which case you will say that the amount extracted every year is increment plus i t minus i of a regular or a normal forest divided by p. p is generally taken to be one third of the rotation period. Next we have the quotas formula and quota formula says that the volume uh, that the annual yield is equal to the the volume or the growing stock divided by the number of years in the periodic block plus i by 2, where i is the annual increment. Then the next method is yield regulation by the number of trees, in which case we plot the curve for a normal forest, we plot the actual field situations and there in the N D curve, we can see that for each and every diameter classes, how many trees can be extracted to bring our forest close to the normal forest. And finally, we have yield regulation by simulation through computers, in which case we input the current inventory, we input growth parameters, we iterate it to get uh, to generate a growth pattern of the forest, make decisions about filling, input the, the filling decision to the model and then iterate it once again. And this process will go on again and again. So, after this iteration, you will again make a decision about filling, input the filling decision, iterate then again make a decision about filling, input the filling decision, I trade and this process will go on and on. Now, in module 10, we looked at silvicultural practices that is seed collection and treatment, nursery techniques, planting and tending. In seed collection, we defined seed as an embryonic plant that is enclosed in an outer protective coating. This is how seeds look like. So, you have an outer protective coating in the uh, form of a seed coat and you have the embryonic plant which is shown as the cotyledons, which are the leaves and the hypocotyl and there is endosperm, which provides food to this embryo. Now, we defined good seeds, good seeds are well ripened and healthy, they are pure and free from inert materials and weed seeds, viable and have good germination capacity, uniform in their structure and appearance, free from damage and should not be broken and infected by pests and diseases. Now, the quantity of seeds that you need for your operations depends on the number of plants that are required, including the uh, amount that you will require to beat up casualty, plus the germination percentage, plus uh, uh, it depends on the loss in pricking out, mortality in seedling containers or transplanting and the culling loss. And the total quantity of seeds required is given by the number of seedlings that are required for planting divided by the survival factor where survival factor is given as germination percentage multiplied by pricking loss factor percentage multiplied by mortality factor multiplied by culling loss factor. And total quantity of seeds that is required is given by total number of seeds divided by number of seeds per kg. Now, when we are doing a seed collection, we need to determine the best days for seed collection. Typically, seeds are collected in the seed years when the plants have a, a very large production of seeds. But even in the seed year, which is the particular day where, when you should be doing the collection is determined by either laboratory methods or field methods. Now, laboratory methods include maximum dry weight, chemical analysis of fat and nitrogen content, 
examination of embryo development and endosperm of sample seeds through X-ray radiographs, typically by soaking of the seeds in barium chloride solution, which makes it opaque to um, the X-rays. And barium chloride is only able to enter into the non-living portions; it does not enter into the living portions. So you can very easily see the uh, the embryonic development, or you can look at the moisture content of the fruits. The field methods includes density of fruits, color of fruits and visual examination of seed contents after cutting. We also uh, determine the best trees to collect the seeds from and these are generally dominant or co-dominant trees. You collect from a minimum of 10 to 50 trees, collect from trees that are far from each other to avoid collecting from half siblings or parents. Before collecting mark individual trees, collect equal number of cones, fruits or seeds per tree mixing of trees uh, mix for large scale collections. Now, for a proper seed collection you need to organize collecting trims, transportation equipment, records, permits and seed extraction, because as soon as you collect these seeds they have to be processed. Now, ways of collecting seeds include uh, natural seed fall, manual shaking, mechanical shaking, use of tree funnels, reading of animal caches including squirrels and ants collection by plucking and collection by cutting, breaking and sawing, which is typically the last. Other operations include depulping, where the pulp is removed, drying under the shade, sun drying, drying with artificial heat or kilns, de-winging of seeds, hand picking of large sized impurities, threshing, sieving, blowing, grading, testing and so on. Now, seed testing, uh, we require information about the determination of genuineness determination of purity, determination of seed viability and vigor. Now, seed viability and vigor, the vigor is uh, the rate at which these uh, seeds will actually uh, grow into plants. So, th these are determined by cutting test, physical test such as winnowing and floating, chemical test such as TTZ or triphenyl tetrazoleum chloride or bromide reduction test. The viable parts are stained in red, non living parts become colorless. So, if you have a seed in which uh, it looks uh, colorless throughout, it means that it has already died. Or we can look at germination test in which the seeds are actually germinated, in which case we look at two parameters germination percentage, which is the number of seeds that germinate as a percentage of the total number of seeds that were tested and the germination energy, which is the number of seeds in the sample that germinate up to the peak germination period expressed as a percentage. Or you can look at x-ray radiograms, where barium chloride is used, which permeates the dead tissue, but not the living tissue. Now, during storage, we need to look at the natural longevity of tree seeds. There are certain trees, uh, trees where, which are known as microbiotic. Now, in the case of microbiotic plants, the, uh, the seed life span does not exceed 3 years. Macrobiotic seeds last for 15 to over 100 years, mesobiotic uh, seeds last for 3 to 15 years. And uh, during storage, we classify seeds into two categories, orthodox and recalcitrant. Orthodox uh, seeds are those seeds that can be dried down to a low moisture content of around 5 percent and successfully stored at low or sub freezing temperatures for very long periods, such as grass seeds. Whereas, recalcitrant seeds are those that cannot survive drying below a relatively high moisture content, often in the range of 20 to 50 percent and which cannot be successfully stored for long periods, example sal seeds. So, it is difficult to store the recalcitrant seeds, it is easy to store the orthodox seeds after drying. Now, there are a number of factors that affect the longevity in storage, the seed condition including seed maturity, mechanical damage, fungi and insects and the initial viability the age of the seeds and the storage conditions. So, typically the level of oxygen should be kept low, moisture should be kept low, temperature should be kept low and light should be absent. Now, underlying principles of seed banking include identification of accession, maintenance of viability and propagability, which needs to be checked and tested again and again, maintenance of genetic integrity, maintenance of germplasm health, physical security of collections availability and use of germplasm and availability of information. Now, these days we also go for seed certification, which tells us the genuineness of the species and the variety, the year of collection, 
the origin of these seeds or the provenancing of these seeds, the purity, the germinative capacity and any other relevant information. Now, before using we put the seeds through several treatments including cold water treatment, hot water treatment, boiling water treatment, wet and dry treatment, acid or mechanical scarification, shell cracking or cow dung slurry treatment. So, different uh, species of, uh, of trees the, uh, their seeds might require different treatments in order to help them to germinate. Next we had a look at the nursery techniques. Forest nursery is a production unit where forest seedlings are grown. There is a big need to for these nurseries to grow and maintain a large number of plants per unit area. Uh, small and expensive hybrid seeds can be raised more effectively due to better care and management in these nurseries. There is an increased germination percentage and vigor of seedlings grown in seed beds, better management with reduced care, cost and maintenance due to small area easy manipulation of growing conditions, better and uniform crop growth, off season sowing of seeds, lower seed requirement and easy management. So, essentially what we are saying is that in the case of a nursery in a small area you raise a large number of seeds, uh, uh, seeds and seedlings in a much controlled environment in which manipulations are much easier. So, effectively this leads to the production of a large number of seedlings uh, in less time with less cost with less efforts overall. Where should a nursery be sited? So, it depends on the topography of the area. Typically, it should be a flat topography with good soil, good water, good drainage, easy availability of transportation and labor, good protection from animals. It should be near large markets or plantation sites, so that the seedlings can easily be transported and it should typically be located in a pollution free area, so that the plant leaves are not covered up with dust. Now, this is a nursery layout. So, typically in a nursery you will be having the seed beds, you will be having certain store rooms, you will be having a source of water, you will be having certain trees to provide shading when required, you will be having roads, you will be having fencing. Now, a nursery fencing can be a barbed wire fencing, barbed wire fencing on wooden post, brushwood fencing, stone wall fencing, chain link fencing, live fencing and so on. Now, a nursery is identified by the board and uh, these days at times the, uh, the, the setting up and uh, running of a nursery is also given to the samitis. Now, nurseries have nur nursery beds where a bed is defined as a land that is made free of weeds, stumps, stones, pebbles etcetera used for sowing of seeds to raise seedlings and multiplication through vegetative propagation. And we have three different kinds of beds. We have a sunken bed, which is used in dry season and windy areas because it conserves moisture. We have a raised bed, which is used in wet seasons to prevent water logging. And we have a flat bed, which is at the ground level and is the uh, is used in average sorts of conditions. So, here we have raised beds, sunken beds, uh, the plants in the beds. And this is a nursery, which is raising polypots on plastic sheets in a flat bed. Now, before using the soil, it is put through certain treatments. So, we do soil solarization, in which case the soil is broken up, the lumps are broken up and then uh, this soil is exposed to the sun, so that it becomes dried up and also uh, the, uh, the pathogens die off because of the uh, because of drying and also the impact of the ultraviolet rays of the sun. In certain cases, treatment with chemicals may also be required especially treatment with formalin fungicides such as kaptan and therum, insecticides such as chloropyrifos and bioagents such as trichoderma fungus, which is a symbiotic fungus which helps the plants. Now, seed treatment uh, before sowing we do a seed treatment through soaking or acid scarification or mechanical scarification and at times treatment with fungicides and or insecticides may also be required. Next, we have the growing medium, which is com, uh, comprised of soil, sand, compost and additives. Now, sand and compost are added uh, to change the structure of the soil, to make it uh, more permeable and also to change the amount of nutrient availability in the soil. Now, additives include uh, moss, peat, coco peat, vermiculite, perlite, sawdust and so on. 
and we also make a potting medium which is a 1 is to 1 is to 1 a mixture of sand soil and compost or farmyard manure. Now, seed sowing can be done through broadcasting in which the seeds are just thrown over the soil or we can go with line sowing or seed sowing in plug trees. So, this is a plug tray the best thing about a plug tray is that it is a standardized equipment or a standardized uh, medium and so it is very easy to automate the sowing of seeds through machines. Now, a lot of caring needs to be done in nurseries such as proper shift uh, proper handling during shifting the pots should be held from the base not from the top proper placement of pots they should be flat they should not be kept on an incline because the roots are positively geotropic and if the pots are kept at an uh, at an inclined angle then the plants will uh, not be uh, growing straight. So, they will be growing at an angle to the ground which will become diff, uh, difficult for them when uh, you have to plant them out in the field. Then uh, thinning of plant density needs to be done from time to time to avoid whipping. Uh, whipping is the process in which the plants grow very fast they become very tall and because of uh, uh, because they are unable to grow uh, in laterally. So, in this case the plants just droop down when you take them out. Then watering needs to be done, weeding needs to be done, hardening of plants has to be done in which case you make the plant more resistant to the extreme situations outside. Then staking for support is needed for certain plants, clipping of excess root, control of diseases and control of pests. So, here we are seeing people who are caring for the plants the plants have to be watered in such a manner that the amount of water is neither too less nor is too high. Because uh, in drought conditions as well as in waterlogged conditions the plants will not be able to show optimal growth. Hardening is the process of acclimatization of uh, the plants to harsh field and in this case uh, the plants are being moved from an area of excessive or optimal care to an area of harsh conditions. And typically hardening is done by putting the plants under a green net. So, uh, from a very low amount of light they will slowly and steadily they will be shifted to the very harsh 100 percent sunlight and dry conditions. Weeding is regularly performed, grading is performed in which the plants that are of uh, simil, uh, similar growth characteristics and of similar uh, size they are graded together. Here we see plants that are ready for sale or usage they are transported either in uh, in small trucks or using tractors. Plants are grown are these days also grown in containers. We also have this innovation that is known as the raised iron bed in which case we make use of an iron rods to raise up the bed and uh, we put containers and raise the crops there. In certain nurseries greenhouse is being used, mist chambers are being used and vegetative propagation and tissue culture are also being used in certain high tech nurseries. Next we looked at planting and tending. So, areas that are available in the field include recently clear filled areas, areas where forest cover is to be increased, open areas whether in forest or in wasteland or in panchayati land alongside roads, canals, railway lines and in agroforestry and farm for forestry operations. What are the, the considerations? There should be sufficient area available so that you can put up a sufficient amount of work. The area should be accessible during monsoons and labor should be easily available. We begin by making soil profile pits to, uh, to uh, classify soils into three zones. Zone 1 is a refractory site with very less soil depth, it is not suitable for planting trees. Zone 3 uh, which has a soil depth of greater than 30 centimeters is best suited for planting and zone 2 uh, with 10 to 30 centimeters of soil depth planting can be done, but it, it is done together with pasture development. And before uh, beginning to plant we do a pre planting survey and make a treatment map. So, areas to be planted areas to be left unplanted uh, will be marked on this map there will be species selection site preparation planning is done layout of roads inspection paths fire lines water points etcetera is made. Construction of treatment map uh, is done which shows all of these different things layout, slope, soil depth, fertility and so on and then these zones are demarcated on the ground. Then site preparation is done by clearing of the site, the uh, unwanted vegetation is removed, soil conservation works are done to prevent soil erosion and surface runoff, 
moisture conservation works are done, provisioning of proper drainage is done and fencing is done through barbed wire fencing, chain link fencing, stone wall fencing, CPT which is a cattle proof trench and also live hedging. Next we to ensure uh, uniform spacing, we do a staking operation where the planting and soil working spots are marked on the land using stakes that are made out of branches, uh, bamboo pieces, stones, lime and so on. The choice of spacing depends on the objective of the plantation, the, uh, the site and species matching, the growth rate that is expected and the soil moisture depth and so on. So, this is the person who is doing a staking. So, this point is marked on the ground and then the soil working needs to be done. So, soil working includes ploughing of the whole area or in strips or pit digging. So, we can make ordinary pit in normal areas, saucer pit in areas that have less rainfall, crescent edge pits in areas with even less rainfall, ring pits in even uh, more arid regions or we can go with ridge and ditch in areas where the rainfall is unpredictable or we can go with contour trenches, uh, staggered trenches or continuous trenches or we can go with mounds in waterlogged areas. So, this is how the digging begins. So, here there is a stick that is telling us the size of the pit that will be dug and now the digging process is beginning and during the digging process the top soil is kept in a separate pile and the uh, subsoil is kept in a different pile. So, this is a pit that has been dug, measurements are taken to ensure that there is a good quality control. Now, planting can be done in three different periods. In most of the areas we do planting in the monsoons, but in those areas where we get pre monsoon showers or those areas where we have irrigation, we can extend the growing period by doing a pre monsoon planting. And in those areas which are cold or receive winter rains, we can also do winter winter planting or even spring planting. Now, planting in the field is done by removing the polythene cover and then the plant along with the soil ball is placed inside. You need to ensure that the collar is at the same level as that of the ground. Then the soil is put back inside. Typically, the top soil is put up first followed by the subsoil and then uh, this uh, uh, the soil is compacted by standing over it and while taking care that you do not uh, stand on top of the plant. Typically, in the field situations planting is done on a very large scale and then once the planting is done you need to tend for these plants, you need to care for these plants by watering them. Uh, it may be important in arid and semi arid regions and it is absolutely needed in fast growing plantations and urban plantations. In certain cases, you might need fertilizers, in especially in the case of fast growing plants, otherwise it is generally not needed. Weeding needs to be performed together with loosening of soil. Weeding can be done as uh, complete weeding, strip weeding or circular weeding. Then beating up of casualties is done, where the plants that have died are replaced. Singling operation is done for forked plants and in coppice growths and also mulching may be required. And at all stages, you ensure that data entry in is done in the plantation journal. In the last module, we looked at newer trends in forestry, NTFP, social forestry, tribal welfare and conservation of wild animals. Now, NTFP is non-timber forest produce. We have the definition of forest produce and definition of timber entry in the Indian Forest Act. So, you take the definition of forest produce, subtract timber and you get the non-timber forest produce. Now, typically a number of other terms are also used such as non wood forest produce, minor forest produce, byproduct of forest and so on. Now, minor forest produce is defined as all products that are obtainable from forest besides wood, firewood and pulp wood. Non timber forest produce is also defined as all usufructs or utility products of plants, animals and mineral origins except timber obtainable from forest or afforested land areas. Now, in all these different definitions, uh, they can be more, exclu uh, more exclusive or more inclusive. So, in, in certain definitions, we include not just forest, but also plantations and in certain other definitions, we also include the trees outside forest. In certain definitions, we only look at the plant produce, in certain other definitions, we include animal produce and also the mineral produce. And in certain other definitions, we also include the ecological services. So, 
uh, none of these definitions is perfect, but you get an idea. The classification of NTFPs is done on the basis of the product, whether they are gums, raisins, oils, fibers, dyes, medicines, by user purpose, food medicine, spiritual and traditional uses, construction materials, by the type of NTFP that is harvested, leaf, fruit, stem, exudates, animal products or by the level of use, whether it is being used in a self supporting or sustainable manner or in a commercial manner. Next, we looked at some important NTFPs including medicinal plants, gums, pine resin. Now, resin on distillation gives you rosin and turpentine oil, both have different uses. Volatile oils, fatty oils, tannins, dyes, fibers, we looked also at the classification of fibers, non wood forest produce of animal origin and also the other NTFPs. In the second lecture of this module, we looked at social forestry and tribal welfare. Now, social forestry is defined as forestry, which aims at producing flow of protection and recreation benefits for the community. So, basically a social forestry says that if you want to protect the forest, you can only do it, when the local people are able to uh, gain benefit from it. And historically, we have seen that people have had a close relationship with forest and social forestry aims to encourage this relationship to inculcate a feeling of, uh, of ownership of the people towards the forest to ensure that the people are uh, more and more inclined to conserve the forest. Now, the benefits that are provided to the people are in the form of livelihood, income, NTFP, ecological services and ethnic food security. And then we looked at a short history of forestry and why the social forestry was so important. So, even though the 1865 forest act said that the notification will not shall not abridge or affect any existing rights of individuals or communities, but in those days the field situation was not that good, people were uh, largely illiterate and they were not able to put forth their uh, rights and their demands in a forceful manner. Now, because of which a lot of areas were converted into forests and people did not get to see a lot of things. They were not able to exert their rights. Now, the 1878 forest act further extended it, but then there was an opposition to the 1878 act by the Purna Sarvajanik Sabha and also by Jyoti Rao Phule. Now, the 1894 forest policy classified forests into four different categories, but it also wrote the sentence that the sole object with which state forests are administered is the public benefit and no restriction should be placed upon reasonable local demands merely in order to increase the state revenue. So, we are saying that even in the 19th century, we are shifting from, from the, the government utilization of forest for revenue towards social forestry. That is, we are uh, shifting towards the usage of forest for meeting of the local needs. But then we had the first world war, where uh, timber was extensively needed and there was uh, an indiscriminate cutting of forest, followed by the Indian Forest Act, which was a revised act, but more or less the same structure was kept. And then in 1931, we saw the beginning of the one panchayats. So, in the case of one panchayat, the panchayat exerts its ownership on the forest and also it maintains and conserves the forest. So, it began in the hill districts of Uttarakhand. Then in the 1954 forest policy, while forest legislation, forest education and forest research constitute the basis for, so, uh, for sound forest management, the welfare and goodwill of the people in the neighborhood of forest provides the firm ground on which it stands. No forest policy, however well intentioned and meticulously drawn up has the slightest chance of success without the willing support and cooperation of the people. So, with this 1954 forest uh, policy, we said that social forestry is now an integral part, we need to look at it, without it we will not be able to conserve the forest. Then came the 1976 National Commission on Agriculture, which further elaborated on this concept and it was the first to actually use the term social forestry, but it also expanded its definition. It said that there will be full forestry, community forestry, extension forestry and agroforestry. So, what are the differences between conventional forestry and social forestry? Conventional forestry is typically long rotation crops, social forestry is short rotation crops, conventional forestry is done by department, 
social forestry is done in collaboration with the society. Conventional uh, forestry is based on a single use of forest for timber, whereas social forestry is based on multiple use of forest including NTFPs. And then a watershed moment came in 1988. With the 1988 forest policy, we said that massive people's movement is essential and will be done to minimize pressure on the existing forests. And so, we had the beginnings of the joint forest management in the 1980s. So, this, in, uh, this includes NGOs and the individuals do not get rights, but the usufruct rights are given to the community. The area selected should be free from claims, micro plans are made in consultation with the community and sharing of benefits is linked to proper protection of the area. So, through joint forest management, people get employment uh, in plantation control of invasives. Tindupata is a big thing. So, uh, in Tindupata, people and a lot of women specifically, they get uh, uh, sufficient amount, uh, they get uh, uh, large amounts of money for the collection of Tindupata and also uh, through means of profit sharing mechanism, when this Tindupata is sold to outsiders. Then, in certain uh, cases, the samitis are also setting up their own shops, they are also doing minor processing, they are also setting up their own nurseries and the department also facilitates the provisioning of medical services and other things. So, uh, social forestry is basically a change in perspective. So, the department is shifting from policing to socializing, from domination to equality, from uniformed staff to being an equal implementer from telling what to do to listening what to do and so on. So, basically social forestry is a new perspective and it also requires a number of new skills such as communication skills, knowledge about NTFP, motivational skills, organizational skills and so on. Now, finally, we looked at the conservation of wild animals. So, conservation uh, comes from the word roots, corn and surveyor, which is keep together. It is different from preservation, environmentalism and ecology. Wildlife is defined uh, in the Wildlife Protection Act. It includes any animal, aquatic or land vegetation, which forms part of any habitat. So, it is a pretty wide definition. And there are a number of uh, species of animals that are in different uh, levels of uh, uh, red list. So, there are certain animals that are already extinct, some are extinct in the wild, some are critically endangered and we move down to endangered, vulnerable, near threatened least concerned, data deficient and not evaluated. Now, to conserve wildlife, we need to do a prioritization, because here again the needs are unlimited, but the resources are limited. So, there has to be a prioritization. So, for prioritization, we look at keystone species, which play a much greater role in the functioning of the ecosystem as compared to their numerical abundance. We look at umbrella species, which require large home areas and we look at flagship species that people actually love. And we, we, uh, we try to focus our conservation efforts towards those species that are uh, one uh, that have mo one or more of these characteristics, preferably all three of them. So, for instance, tiger is uh, uh, a big thing in our country, tiger uh, a lot of uh, money and efforts are being put towards the conservation of tiger, because it is a keystone species together with being a flagship species and an umbrella species. Now, we saw that all species are not equally susceptible to extinction. Those species that are rare, typically because they live in an uncommon habitat, have limited geographical range or have low population densities, they are rarer. And we looked at hippo, uh, which is habitat loss, invasive species, population and pollution and over harvesting, which is driving a number of species towards extinction. In extinction, two kinds of factors are operating, deterministic factors at large population size and stochastic factors. We looked at deterministic and stochastic factors and the impacts of humans. Now, in conservation, there are two different modes. One is in situ conservation, which is on site and the second is ex situ conservation, which is off the site. In the case of in situ conservation, we designate areas as reserves, national parks or protected areas ecological monitoring and, and interventions are done, legislations are required to maintain these areas as protected areas. The benefit is that species continue to live. Next, we looked at advantages of in situ conservation, disadvantages uh, and also ex situ conservation, advantages and the disadvantages. 
Now, in the case of ex situ conservation, the examples include zoos, aquaria, captive breeding facilities, botanical gardens, bamboo seta, arboreta, seed banks, cryo preservation facilities and so on. And then we looked at zoo as an example of ex situ conservation. In our country, the zoo is uh, the zoos are regulated by the CZA or the Central Zoo Authority, which uh, uh, approves the zoo master plans, helps in conservation breeding, helps in standardization of stud books. And we looked at uh, the case study of Mysur Zoo as an example, what all things are done, how animals are cared for. Then we looked at bear rescue facility and so on and also the, the need for behavior enrichment, so that the animals do not feel bored. Now, next we looked at in situ conservation. So, we started with the traditional ways of creating reserves. Earlier reserves were created by looking at beautiful areas, high species diversity or areas that are harboring unique animals. But these days, if you look at scientific uh, creation of reserves, we have to look at uh, areas with high species richness. So, that is more number of species per unit area high species endemism, which is those species that are only found in certain areas and high number of species under threat. So, we can look at all these different maps and then come up with those sites that have high richness endemism and threat and they are known as the biodiversity hotspots. Now, typically the level of threat that we are targeting is a middle level of threat, because if it is very low threat, then uh, probably you do not need a sanctuary or a reserve and if the threat is very high, then probably uh, even the construction of a sanctuary is not going to help that situation or uh, the uh, in the time that it will take to construct the sanctuary, the area will or, uh, already be lost. We also looked at gap analysis, which identifies holes in the existing network of protected areas. Then we looked at principles of reserve design, you need to have big reserves, because it is cost in uh, cost effective and also it provides more habitats. It is uh, less vulnerable to catastrophes. So, one big is better than several small, uh, closer reserves are to be promoted, cluster formation is preferred as compared to a linear formation, circular reserves are preferred, because they have low biotic pressure, connection needs to be ma uh, to be maintained. And then we looked at of sanctuary creation. So, like in Madhya Pradesh, we uh, the government began with looking at the biodiversity intactness index map, which tells us what are the, the locations where the biodiversity is still found. So, this is an indication of the species richness. Uh, then gap analysis, is then we also did a gap analysis to understand which are the locations that need sanctuaries. And then we also looked at cluster approaches. Uh, how to maintain the connectivity of these habitats, how to come up with new stepping stone corridors, while ensuring that the level of threat is kept as low as possible. So, basically we, we went with only reserve forest areas, where all the rights are there with the government and where we do not have any villages or encroachments or forest right pattas, which have been given over the years. And with that, we, uh, uh, we came to the conclusion about what are the areas and of the sanctuaries that need to be made. So, that brings us to the conclusion of this course. I hope you like this course. Good luck with your exam preparation. Do well. So, that is all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.